often quote that psalm as a motivation for us to pass on to our children and to the next generation what we know of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But this morning, I want to point out the privilege and the honor that it is to be a child who has received the faithfulness of a previous generation in passing on the glorious deeds of the Lord and the wonders that he has done. Mickey Connolly has been a pastor in Sovereign Grace for 30 years now. Uh, he has been a leading voice in proclaiming the centrality of the gospel to myself and Aaron and all of the pastors that are 40 and under. We have received over the decades uh, his wisdom, his passion for the gospel, his example, along with many other men, including our own Ricky Ramos over the years, and how God has used these men to establish a foundation in our family of churches of exegetical preaching and the passion for the presence of God, a love for sound doctrine, a love for gospel-centered living and community life and mission. God has used this man in my life also uh, as a, a means of fatherly encouragement. Uh, Mickey is funny. He is gruff in certain moments, as you'll, I'm sure, notice this morning. But behind that exterior, there is the heart of a father who wants to see sons exceed him, who wants to see sons be established in ministry. And I know there are many young men who feel as I do that even just a few moments with him gives you the sense that you have a cheerleader cheering you on. And so since Aaron and I get to preach and serve you week by week, I wanted you to know that behind that service is this man and others like him who are helping us to do that effectively. Mickey serves as the director of church care or development. He uses both titles. I guess he likes a double titled uh, position. Uh, director of church care and development for our Sovereign Grace churches. That means he basically takes care of a lot of very difficult, tricky situations, and he cares for regional leaders like Billy Reyes, who in turn care for pastors. So he's basically the guy who has to care for everybody. Uh, in our family of churches. Um, we, we want you to know what a gift it is for us to be cared for by Mickey and the other men in the leadership team. It makes it much, much easier for us to pastor when we are pastored by them. So with that in mind, would you welcome Mickey as he comes to speak to us? And yeah, that was too kind. Uh, thank you so much, John. It, uh, it's really a joy to be here. I have watched from a distance and just heard about this church uh, being built, and now to experience uh, it is a real joy for me, although I, I have to, I feel like I would be dishonest to not make a confession here publicly. It was only yesterday that I learned that the name of your town is actually Round Rock and not Red Rock, Texas. So I actually, if you, if you see my notes at the, at the top, it says Red Rock, Texas. <laughs> so, uh, but then yesterday somebody said Round Rock. I, I thought, really, it's Round Rock? It's not Red Rock? So I had to get on the map. But to make up for it, I actually Googled Red Rock. And so now I am, I, I, I am full of the history of Red Rock. <laughs> I mean Round Rock. I, I know all about the, the roundish rock that the town is named after. The, um, the person that named it the Round Rock is not a geometry major. <laughs> but, but Roundish Rock just does, doesn't have the same ring. I learned about Sam Bass getting shot here and just a variety of things. So uh, I, love, uh, I love just being new places, being different places. And to be here uh, with you all is, is a real privilege. I, I love um, your pastors, and um, I'm so glad Ricky and Laurie are here, just in the ways that they serve you. Uh, John, in particular, is just, um, he's such a gift to Sovereign Grace, and just the way he serves us extra locally as the chairman of our executive committee in a variety of other ways. So it's been a real joy to get to know him. One of my uh, highlights from last year was actually to get to introduce John at the pastor's conference. Uh, where he spoke and just did a wonderful job. So 
Um, but, but what I really have to say above all is I think a lot of times we talk about leaders and the older guys and younger guys and things that people are doing. But it's, it's not the leadership team or regional leaders or even pastors that make sovereign grace what it is. It's you. You, you, are, you are sovereign grace churches. Uh, you are the ones that make sovereign grace churches what it is. Your, your love for uh, God and your love for uh, the gospel and your love for the local church and your faithfulness uh, to just build together with one another. There wouldn't be a sovereign grace without you. So more than anything else, let me just thank you for all you do to make sovereign grace what it is and allow us uh, to just in a very small way to contribute to what that is. So thanks, thanks, thanks for being sovereign grace churches. And uh, just to see your faces is a pure joy. Well, uh, you can open your Bibles to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, I got saved reading a fake Bible. And that probably needs some explanation for you. Uh, I was, I was raised Catholic, and uh, I was 27 years old and lying in bed with my wife one night reading. And uh, she just leaned over to me and said, I, I just, I just uh, got saved. I read in the back of this book, I was reading a, a kind of a sinner's prayer, and I repeated it, and it said I needed to be born again, and so I was. And yes, yeah, so I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But in what I would now know was just the way God works to draw people to that, to that moment of regeneration, that moment of being saved, um, I just, I just, it started to bother me. I had actually never in my life heard the term born again. And, um, you know, unless you're born again, you can't uh, enter the kingdom of God. And so I just, I just started to have this fear about going to hell. And so uh, I thought, well, I better, I better check this out. And so literally, I was, I was 28 by this time. Uh, and I had never in my entire life, 28 years, opened up a Bible and read a single word of the Bible in my entire life. Uh, and as well, I didn't even own a Bible. And so the only Bible we had in the house was uh, a paraphrase. It's not actually fake, but it's a paraphrase. It's the good news for modern man. Some of you might be familiar with it. It was a paraphrase and it had these little stick fingered uh, figure drawings in there. So some of you are following me. And so... Uh, I remember just reading it, and I, I didn't know what to do, so I just, Matthew, it was just the New Testament, Matthew, Mark. I was glad it wasn't new and old, because I probably would have started in Genesis and quit. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and I got to John chapter 3, and I read those words, you must be born again, and I was, just by God's sovereign, electing, kind uh, grace to me. And that, that really began uh, a love affair with a book. Uh, the love affair with God's Word, a love affair with the Bible. Uh, I'll never forget uh, shortly afterwards thinking, well, I probably need a real Bible, not the fake one. And so we went to a Christian bookstore in the area. We lived in Maryland at the time, went to a Christian bookstore. And I walked in, I remember being just amazed by two things. One, that there were all these books, Christian books. I had no idea there was even such a category as Christian books. Uh, but the other was that there were so many different Bibles. Like I remember standing before this massive shelf of different Bibles and, and not knowing. So I just picked out the one that looked the best on the outside. Uh, turned out to be a New American Standard Bible, first Bible I ever owned. Um, but uh, I, I have loved this book. I've loved the Bible from, from that day forward. My soul, I'm 68 years old now, just continues to thrill that I, I have a Bible, that I have God's Word. One, one of the great frustrations of my life is actually at 68. I've been a pastor for 34 years. Um, I've taught through or in almost every single book of the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, and yet I find myself constantly frustrated that I'm going to die and there's so much more of the depth of this, of God's Word that I want to explore and that I want to know. And I just kind of feel like if I live to be 168, I'm never going to be able to study all the things that I want to, that I want to know, that I want to understand. There's so much I want to learn from this book. Now, being a pastor for 30 plus years, however, I think it's unwise to assume that we are all in the same place. 
I find that it's very easy for Christians to kind of take having God's word for granted. Uh, I find that they can find it easy, can become too commonplace to them, it can become too mundane, as often it's, it becomes too neglected. The uh, statistics on Christians and Bible reading is not encouraging. The uh, statistics tell us that only 45% of regular church goers read their Bible more than once a week, 45% and that 27% of regular churchgoers never read their Bibles. And that the uh, statistics are actually getting worse uh, when, as, as, as younger people are, are surveyed. The younger you get, the worse these statistics get. So uh, what I want to do today is just talk to you about your Bible. I want to try to encourage you about uh, having uh, God's Word. And what I want to propose is simply this, that nothing, nothing is more important to your spiritual health and well-being and to the spiritual health and well-being of your families and to a significant degree the spiritual health and well-being of this local church. Nothing is more important than your Bible reading and study and application. Nothing is more important that we as Christians in local church become first and foremost Bible people, people of God's Word. And to that end, I want to uh, just take some time to explore uh, this wonderful passage about God's Word in 2 Timothy chapter 3. So uh, let's just enjoy the wonderful privilege of simply hearing uh, God's word read. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. Paul, the apostle, writing to Timothy, a young man in the faith. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Let's pray together. Father, um, can't thank you enough for your word and the privilege it is this morning to preach your word to your people, but uh, I need your help. We need your help. So, uh, Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would come this morning and bring uh, appropriate uh, conviction, bring appropriate joy, uh, bring uh, appropriate awe and wonder, uh, at the, the ability that we have to have uh, your word and to hear your word. So, Holy Spirit, help me to serve your people, uh, help your people uh, affect our hearts and our minds with uh, these realities, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what I want to do this morning is two things. Uh, one, I just want to take a little time to explain uh, this passage that I just read to you, so, I, so I just really understand what we really have here uh, in God's Word to us, and then just some simple points of application for you to think about uh, as you uh, read and, and study the Scriptures. So uh, there's just a variety of, of, of truths about God's Word that I, that I want to speak to this morning. Uh, the first is that what we have here is what's called the in inspired word, that the word of God is inspired, that uh, we, we, we read there in verse 16 that all scripture is breathed out by God. It's just another way of scripture saying that, that it is God himself who has spoken these words that we have here in our Bibles uh, to us. Uh, Peter actually elaborates on this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. 
he talks about how this, this interaction between how, how is it that God breathed out, but men actually wrote down uh, the scriptures. So, you know, Paul and, and John and Matthew and Mark and Isaiah and Jeremiah, you know, how is it, how did that happen? And Peter explains it in 121 this way, uh, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, I think it is so easy for us, particularly if you've been a Christian for a long time, I think it's so easy for us to kind of overlook and just assume what an amazing statement it is that all Scripture is breathed out by God and men were uh, spoke from God being carried along by the Holy Spirit. What you have in your laps or on your phone or at home, what you have are the very words of God to man. The very words of God to man. And not just some of the words, not just the big ideas. Well, there's, there's, there's big God ideas in here. No, the very words, all the words. In other words, every uh, every and, every the, every of, uh, the, the, from, the, from the smallest of words to the biggest of words, every word, all of Scripture is breathed out by God. Now, let's just think about, let's just take a moment. I don't want us to assume. Let's just take a moment to think about that. What you have in your possession in this book are the very words of God to you. The very words of God. What, what does that statement draw out of your heart? What does that thought evoke in you? Is there a sense of awe and wonder? The very words of God. Is there, does joy rise up in your heart? I have the very words of God. Gratitude, humility. Think about this for a moment. The, the creator of the universe, the creator God, the holy God has condescended to give sinful, rebellious people to speak to us, to give us, to enable us to possess his very words to us, all of those words. It's, a, it's an awe-inspiring, humbling thing when we recognize what we really have here, isn't it? Uh, there's kind of a popular icebreaker that you, you probably played or experienced at one time or another where somebody asks the question, so if you could have dinner with any three people, dead or alive, uh, who would those people be? And you just think back through history and you think, yeah, I'd run. And, and the reason you want to have dinner with them is, is generally because you want to learn from them, don't you? You want to pick their brain. You want to ask them questions like, uh, I'd like to have dinner with Adam. Why did you let Eve eat that fruit? What is the matter with you? You know, uh, so you, you, that, that's what you, you want to, you want to know them. You want to draw something out from uh, them. But you want to pick their brains, but, but think about what you have. Your Bible is like sitting down to dinner with God every day of the week, every hour of the day, and being able to prick his brain to, to know what it is that he says to know him in the deepest and most intimate possible way. The very words of God contained in a book in your own language. All scripture is inspired by God. Jonathan Lehman, Lehman in his book, Word Centered Church, said this, God's word is an extension of himself. His identity, purposes, affections, and power. And then he goes on to say that God actually so identifies himself with his word that to hear his words that, comp that, that comprise the whole Bible is to hear him. To hear his words is to hear him. To obey his words is to obey him. To ignore his words is to ignore him. 
He so identifies himself with his word that our responses to his word is our response to him. All scripture is God-breathed. We possess the very words of God. And there are a variety of of theological implications there. Uh, One of them is, uh, because they're the very words of God, the the Bible is said to be inerrant. That is, it contains no errors. And because it contains no errors, we can be, as Christians, 100% confident uh, in it. And actually, if you think about it, it makes, it makes complete sense, doesn't it? That if God is going to communicate to, to men, he's going to do so in a way where he would be certain that it's going to be clear and it's going to be accurate and it's going, it's going to be effectual, that, there, that there's not going to be any miscommunication. Uh, have you ever been in a situation where sometimes you have bad reception on your cell phone and you're not quite understanding what it is that the person is, is saying to you and you're thinking, what? God says I'm a winner? No, 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 a sinner, not a winner. Jesus waves? Well, hi back to him. Nice of him. No, Jesus saves. You know, we can, uh, we can be sure that God is, is, is not going to mix up or make sure that there's any miscommunication here, that his word to us is going to be without error. Now, yeah, are there things that are hard to understand in God's word? Uh, yeah, there are. I, can, I, can't ex- I know what the Trinity means. I can't explain to you the Trinity. I, I, can't, I can't help you with, with that. Uh, I can't explain the Incarnation. How is it that God became fully God and fully man? I don't know. Uh, I can't explain the, the mix between divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Uh, I can't tell you theologians, the, the probably the great theological, theological question, why is there evil? I can't explain that. I don't know. I mean, I can explain biblically what the word says, but I, I, I can't go to the depths of God's wisdom and explain uh, those things to you. So there's hard, there, uh, there's hard things to understand, but there are absolutely no contradictions. There are no errors uh, in God's word. We can be 100% confident that what we have are the very words of God to us. And, 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 and not only that, but, but we can be assured that God has guarded his word to us uh, down through history so it would never face corruption in any way. Uh, well, I think one of the most startling statements of the New Testament is in Matthew 24, verse 35. Now, let, let me set the scene for when this statement was made. Uh, Jesus is well known now. He was just this itinerant carpenter preacher with these 12 kind of loser fishermen and tax collectors and, and kind of the, the guys that were on the outs of society in a very backwater a uh, place in the Roman Empire. So, you know, so get the picture, and, and there's no cell phones, there's no internet, there's no uh, CDs, you know, n- nothing like that. So <laughs> get that picture, and then hear these words, and just again marvel. Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. That's a startling statement to make in Jesus' situation, and yet it's a guarantee to us that throughout history, despite all the attempts to destroy it or have it done away with or keep it out of people's hands, that his word, his very words to us have never passed away and they've come down to us without error and without corruption so that what we have are the very words of God. It's inerrant. The third thing that I want to say about God's word is it's infallible. Now, I think a lot of times uh, people confuse inerrant and infallible and think they're exactly the same thing. Uh, They're not. Infallible means that God's word will accomplish the purpose for which it was breathed out without fail. That uh, God, every word spoken here, there was no, there was no word spoken uh, by God that was just lightly spoken or, or off the cuff. Every word that God spoke to us in his word had a purpose. And and this is the reality. That purpose will will never fail. Um, You know, life is perplexing sometimes, isn't it? 
Uh, all of us run into situations sometimes where, where we're just perplexed. We don't know what to do. We, we don't know where to turn next. Um, sometimes we, we can, life, life can, can tempt us to just, to just be hopeless and say, there's no hope for me. There's no way out of this situation. There's, um, I, I, I don't know where to turn. And, and, and this is what the infallibility of God's word says to us, that if you, if you base your life on God's word, you will find at the end that you have never believed in vain and that you have never followed in vain. That God's word will never fail you. That there is no situation in life that you are in right now. Sometimes it takes some digging and some mining to mine the gold and the, uh, the gold and the reality out of the situation. But here is the reality. When you find out how God's word relates to your situation and you said, I'm going to base my life, I'm going to follow that no matter how perplexed or maybe I don't understand or how hopeless it might feel, God's word will never fail you. It will always accomplish the purpose in your life for which he has spoken it out to you. It is infallible. God's word is authoritative. Uh, God, as our creator, has the right to supremely define what you are to believe and how you are to act. God's word has authority in, in our lives. Um, our, our lives are, are to be lived by the book. Uh, this particular book it makes demands of us. Uh, we have obligations to it. it. It's not just interesting or inspiring, though it is. Uh, it's not some self-help book that we can kind of go to to glean some uh, helpful little sayings to hang up on our walls that uh, kind of encourage our hearts sometimes. Uh, no, it's, it's not that. Because every word is God's word, every word has authority in our lives. Every word possesses supremely the right to say, this is what you are to believe, and this is how you are to live. Uh, Christopher Ashe, in his little pamphlet, Why We Listen, uh, said it this way, No part of the Bible is there simply to inform us or for our interest only. Always, it calls us to turn to God, perhaps in a changed belief or a refreshed delight. And oh, how I love that, that for a refreshed delight. Just that there, there are times, even though God's word is authoritative and we are called to believe it, uh, it is also delightful, isn't it? And, and there are things there that just delight our hearts. And so when we go, sometimes we just, there's fresh delight that we find in God's word. A changed belief or a refreshed delight or a new behavior or an altered value system. So God's word uh, is inspired. It's God's very words. It's an errant, no errors. It's infallible. It will never fail you. It has the right to define uh, your life, what you are to believe, and how you are to act. And then, um, lastly, in this first point, it's all sufficient. It is all sufficient. In verse 15, uh, Paul, Paul speaks to Timothy that the word of God is able to make us wise for salvation. Wise for salvation. Now, the word salvation in Scripture uh, doesn't, doesn't just have to do with that moment that you pass from being an unbeliever to a believer or a pagan to a Christian or dead to alive. Uh, it's, not, it's not limited to that. Uh, our salvation isn't something that happened to us you know, 20 years ago or 40 years ago or two months ago. Uh, and, and it's kind of like a picture that we just put up on a shelf somewhere or a book that we slide in the shelf. So oh, that was nice. That happened to me back then. Uh, biblically, uh, salvation uh, is... is characterizes your entire life from that moment you were saved till the moment Jesus returns and all throughout all of e eternity. It's an extensive term 
in, in, in Scripture. And so it covers your conversion, but it also covers your growth or, or, or maturity in the Lord. So uh, the Bible is sufficient because it's able to make you wise for salvation. It's able to take you from the very beginning of your Christian life to the very end of your Christian life and make you wise for every aspect uh, of your Christian life from beginning to end. So, so Scripture is sufficient in that it contains everything that is required for your salvation, for all matters of faith, for all matters of practice. Uh, it's not a science textbook. It's not a math textbook. It's not a history textbook. Uh, that's not its purpose. It's not sufficient to teach you quantum physics. Um, it, it's, it's none of those things. The sufficiency of Scripture seem, simply means that we need no other source to make us wise for salvation, to cake us from beginning to end. We need no other source. We don't need any tradition. Uh, we don't need the social sciences. We don't need psychology. We need nothing else but God's Word to enable us to be wise for salvation. It's sufficient for every age. It's sufficient for 2,000 years ago and 6,000 years ago, and it's sufficient for today, and it's going to be sufficient for as long as Jesus Christ return. It's going to be sufficient for us because it's timeless. The Word of God is timeless to us, and so it's always sufficient. And as a result, uh, Paul writes to Timothy, because it is sufficient in that way for us, it is profitable to us. This book will profit your life. Some translations use useful or beneficial. That the word of God is profitable or useful or beneficial to us. Uh, John Stott, in his commentary on, on Timothy, said, If we hope to overcome error and grow in truth, to overcome evil and grow in holiness, it is to Scripture that we must go. For Scripture is profitable for these things. It's sufficient. It's profitable for us. And he, he specifically mentions four things, teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So let's just, just look briefly at each of those things. First of all, it's sufficient for teaching us, for instructing us, for imparting knowledge uh, regarding God. It teaches us what God is like. It teaches us what we can expect from him. Uh, it teaches us what uh, he expects of us. It teaches us how we can relate with him. That everything we need to know about God and about living as the people of God is, is taught to us in, in this book. Uh, and so we, we need this. Um, because we need to know these, these things. All, all of the Christian life just starts with knowing certain things, being taught certain things. Uh, Kent Hughes uh, said very simply, you cannot be profoundly influenced by what you do not know. You can't be influenced by this book if you don't know this book, if you're not reading it and studying it. Uh, so it's profitable for teaching. It's, re it's profitable for reproof or rebuking. Um, sometimes... We just need a good talking to, don't we? If anybody ever needed a good talking to in their lives? Anyone has a child that every once in a while just needs a good talking to in their lives? Sometimes we just need a good talking to. And the Bible does that for us. Sometimes the Bible just gives us a good talking to when we, when we need it. It, it. it brings conviction to us. It brings warning to us where, where we're being tempted and, and we just start to go astray and, and we need somebody to talk to us. Um, there, there's truth here that exposes our, our false beliefs or our false ideas or our false doctrines or, or our ungodly conduct. Uh, there are places where uh, the Word of God is, is, is described like a two-edged sword that just cuts both ways in our life. Uh, it's described like a fire uh, that burns in us. Uh, it's described like a hammer that breaks our, our, our stony hearts. Um, I remember one time uh, when I was younger working construction, and uh, I whacked my thumb with a hammer. Now, when you think hammer, don't think those little hammers like you have at home to tack up pictures. I'm talking about a 
heavy framing hammer and I was just, I was building uh, concrete forms and it was just routine and I'm hammering and then I just lost my concentration. And as hard as I possibly could, I hit my thumb with the hammer. And um, liter literally, I don't know what the physical, I, I went blind for about 10 seconds. Literally, I couldn't, I think my body just shut down. I was so much pain that everything just went black. I was completely blind for about 10 seconds. And I'll, I'll never forget that pain. And I have never done that again. From that moment on, I have been, I have been slower, but I have been careful. Um, but I want to tell you something. It got my attention. I noticed when I, when I whacked my thumb and went blind for 10 seconds, it got my attention. Don't put your thumb there anymore. And that's what the Bible does for us. Sometimes it just, we, we need to get our thumbs whacked, don't we? Sometimes God just needs to get our attention. And the Bible profits us for that. That we're just reading along, minding our own business, all of a sudden, whack! And conviction or warning or, or, or you know, help in, in us changing. And I'm grateful that the Bible does those things for us. Uh, it's profitable for correction. Now, this is a little different than reproof that's being talked about here. Correction simply means it gets us back on the right road when we're starting to go astray, when we're starting to get off the road. Um, if we're starting to kind of tilt a little bit, get out of plumb in our life, the Bible brings us back into plumb. It, it, it brings us correction. Um, I have a, I have a, a love-hate relationship with GPS uh, on your phones because um, I, I just loved the, the masculine ability to just say, I don't need directions. I, could, I, I know how to get there. And just to be able to set off and think, I, I can get there. And I don't need to look at a map. I don't. Uh, but now it almost feels wrong to not use uh, GPS. But um, GPS, uh, it's helpful because if you make, if you make the wrong thing, it, it, it corrects you, doesn't it? You know, make a, make a U-turn. And, and then if, you don't, like if you're pulling off to the gas station to go to the bathroom or get a drink or something, then it starts to get irritated with you. Like, Make a U-turn at the next turn. Make a U-turn at the next turn. And I'm, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to develop kind of a cussing aspect of that where if you, if you go off for too long and you don't obey it, it's just going gonna, gonna to start saying bad things to you. I, I, think that would, I think that would be a good part of the app. But how, how, how grateful are you that, that you have GPS that just keeps you going on the right path? And if you take the wrong road, no, 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 turn around, make a U-turn, go... Well, that's what, that's what the Word of God does for us, without the cussing. Uh, but that's what the Word of God does for us, doesn't it? That sometimes we, ju we just, I love the passage in Isaiah. Uh, whenever you turn to the right or the left, there's a voice behind you that says, this is the way, go in it. That's what God does. It, that's how God's Word profits us. It corrects us. And then it trains us in righteousness. Um, this is a word that's often used for training a child. Uh, it's just the reality of it is, uh, there's things in life we, don't, we just don't know, and so it's not like we need to be corrected. We just need to be taught uh, stuff that we do. So the Bible imparts practical wisdom for life. Uh, it doesn't just impart doctrinal truth. It imparts practical wisdom for us for how we can, we, we can live our lives. Not that we're doing anything wrong. It's just like a child. We just haven't learned that yet. And it imparts that to us. It helps us to understand how to practically um, live life. Um, and then, I think this is a term that's, that can be misunderstood. It says, so that we might be competent. Now, I think when we often think of competent, we think of kind of C, getting a C. Um, like, yeah, the, the person's competent. You know, they're, they're average. They're, they're C. But that word doesn't mean that. The, the word competent here means A+. Plus. That the Bible is able to make you A+. Plus. Not just average, but A+. Plus. That, that you're, you can be fully equipped. That you can be completely equipped. That you can be complete. Able to meet every single demand. That the man of God may be equipped for every good work. Uh, there, there is nothing... Uh, in, in Scripture, the profitability of Scripture is for everything. It's extensive. There's nothing that's left out. 
um, as we read it and as we're taught by it and as we're rebuked by it and as we're corrected by it and as we're trained by it, we become A-plus competent people able to accomplish everything that God wants us to accomplish uh, in our life. It's a wonderful, it's a glorious, we should be so grateful, shouldn't we, for God's word that he's condescended to speak his very words to us so that we could be that. But it all comes through faith. Notice in verse 15, it says, it's able to make us wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Simply open up your Bible and reading the words um, or hearing sermons isn't going to make you grow. You have to believe what it is that is said, and you have to apply it to your life. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 21, it's talking about the difference between uh, Israel and the church. And the writer of Hebrews said, uh, For we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did, but the message that they heard was of no value to them. Wow. What was up with that? Well, he explains, because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. See, simply hearing, apart from faith, it's able to make us wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Um, I, I think you can sum up the way the entire Christian life works is by grace through faith. Uh, we need the grace of God. The, the, uh, grace is, is God's is God's enabling power to enable us to do the things that he has called us to that in our natural selves we're not capable of doing. So, so we ought to ask, how do we then get that grace? And the Bible's answer is we get it through faith. And how do we get faith then? Well, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So why is, why is it so important that we combine faith with our reading or our hearing, it's because it's through that faith we we're able to appropriate grace. And so we need to hear the word of God, and then when we hear the word of God in faith, then the grace of God that we need to live the Christian life, it, 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 it comes to us. And that's the way the Christian life works over and over and over again. So if anybody ever asks you, you're carrying your Bible around, what do you got there? Don't just say, well, I have, a, I have my Bible. Say this, what do I have here? What do I have here? I'll tell you what I have here. I have the inspired, inerrant, infallible, authoritative, all-sufficient Word of God that is able to make me competent for every good work. That's what I have here. That would start an interesting conversation, wouldn't it? <laughs> all right, let me make some simple application, and then we close. What time do you end your meeting? Oh, I love that. <laughs> well, in that case, no. Um, very simple application. Um, Paul writes to Timothy, and he says this in regards to the Word of God. But as for you, continue. But as for you, continue in what you've learned. So how do we apply? It's, it's simply this. Continue to be Bible people. Continue to be people of the, the, the Word of God. Never, ever, 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 ever move on for it, from it. Do not let the busyness of life, and life is busy, do not let laziness, do not let familiarity, do not let discouragement, that sometimes it's just we can, we can, we can become discouraged. Do not let any of those things that the devil would try to interject and intrude in your life to keep you from continuing to be a lifelong student and lover of the, the Word of God in, uh, your, in, in your life. Read it, study it, apply it, and do it regularly and do it systematically. And by the way, it's, it's another complete sermon but hear God's word preached. Come here on Sunday mornings and hear God's word preached regularly and systematically to you as well. Now, I assume in a group of this size, uh, there's people here that are in different places when it comes to their intake study, application of the word of God. So um, for some of you, 
you need to start it up. You, you just need to begin to develop the consistent habit of every day opening up your Bible and, and reading and thinking about how to apply what it says to your life. Some of you just need to start it up. Um, and, and, and let me say, just, just start small. Uh, a lot of people are, are fans, for example, of one-year Bible reading plans. I have never been, and I, so I'm not, if, if, if John and Aaron and, and the guys are saying, oh, one-year Bible reading plan. Um, I've never been a fan for this reason. Um, the, the goal then becomes just getting your reading done rather than just digging in. I only read one chapter of the Bible a day. That's all I do, one chapter, uh, because I want to I get the most out of, of that particular chapter. So don't feel all intimidated that, oh, man, okay, I've got I've to start this massive Bible reading program. Uh, and if one chapter is too much for you, just read one of the little headings in, the, in there. But just, just begin. Just start. Let, let a love affair with the Word of God. Let, let what God intends for the Word to do in you. Just start to have its effect. But you can't do it unless you're, you're just opening up and reading. So start it up. Uh, some of you need to pick it up. Um, maybe you got off to a great start when you're first a believer. Man, I love the Word of God, and I'm just, every day I'm going to, every other day, one day I'm going to read the Old Testament, one day I'm going to read the New Testament. You know, you're just passionate and on fire, and then life intrudes, doesn't it? <laughs> Daily life just intrudes, and you, you, you somehow get out of the habit, and then you feel guilty, and you think, oh, I should return, but you just, it, you just never get around to it. So, so just please, just pick it up. And let me say a word to, to moms, particularly young moms with children. Uh, I understand the guilt. My young moms can feel so guilty. Uh, please, just give, give yourself a break, okay, moms? Uh, it's busy. You're tired. So if you miss some days or if it's a season of your life where you're not as regular as you possibly could be, um, you, please re receive grace. Now, I'm not saying uh, moms don't bother because, man, moms of young children, what, is, what, what harder job is there in the world than moms of young children. None. None. So, um, and, and so the Bible will help you in, <laughs> there too. So, but again, sometimes we just need to pick it up. And then uh, for those of you, some of you just need to keep it up. And, and, and thank you. Thanks for your faithfulness. I don't know you all, but I can say this probably without a shadow of a doubt, um, that those, those who have been faithful Bible readers you're the ones that are making the greatest difference in your families and on your jobs and in this church and in the world because you've, you've let the Word of God have its effects on you the way that God intended it to have its effects. So let me, um, let me just give you five kind of challenges as you then either start it up or, or pick it up or keep it up. Five, five challenges. First, uh, just receive the Scriptures with awe and gratitude. Uh, never take them for granted. Every day when you pick up your Bible, just think to yourself, I'm about to word, read the very words of God that will never fail me if I apply them to my life. Uh, secondly, just actively seek to know and obey the commands of God. When you're reading, is, is there something here that God is telling me to do? Uh, thirdly, actively seek to know and believe the promises of God. The Word of God is full of promises to us, of blessings and help. And so find those promises actively and, 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 and believe them. Uh, fourthly, actively, ev uh, actively evaluate your life based on the standards of God. Hold, hold your life up as, as, as a mirror to God's standards and say, how am I doing? Uh, and then fifthly, actively diagnose your problems based on the wisdom of God. This, this problem, this difficulty, this hardship that you're facing, God has something to say about it. Uh, he has a way forward for you. And so actively do that. Thomas Watson, the old Puritan, said, uh, take every word as spoken to yourselves. When the word of God thunders against sin, think thus, God means my sin. When it presseth any duty, God intends me in this. Many put off Scripture from themselves as if it only concerned those who lived in the time when it was written. But if you intend to profit by the word, bring it home to yourselves. A medicine will do no good unless it is applied. 
Uh, let me just finish with this. Uh, in January last year, I began a transition from being the lead pastor, the senior pastor at Crossway Community Church in Charlotte uh, to uh, a couple of other young men that were going to uh, take that position. And so uh, last January, uh, as a start of the year, uh, they asked me to just to, to do a message on, on things that were just on my heart as I was transitioning uh, for you know, that, that coming time. And so I, I, I came up with four things as I prayed. And uh, they, they weren't things that were completely lacking in the church, but just things that I thought, I, I just, they're so important. And I, and I, I want us to grow in, those, in, in these things. And the first and the most important thing, uh, the thing that I spent the most time on was simply this. Be bibline, B-I-B-L-I-N-E, if you want to spell that. Um, bibline is an old word that I really, really like. Um, I actually couldn't find it in any modern dictionary, so it actually might not be a word. Uh, but if it isn't a word, it ought to be a word, uh, because the, the old writers just, just used it on a regular basis. Uh, when the old writers used it, it, it meant Bible-saturated. I, I want a crossway. I want, I want sovereign grace, and I want you as individuals in a church, to be Bible-saturated. People who, who love and treasure and read and live by the, 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 there's every pore of our being just breathes out Bible, God's Word, because our lives are, are saturated with God's Word that we are people who are bibline in the very best sense of the word. Um, Father, I, I, do, I do pray. I thank you for this simple message. Uh, but I pray that uh, we would just take it to heart and uh, that, that there wouldn't be guilt and condemnation. I know the devil would love to come and, and just make people feel bad about where they are and, and then making them feel bad, discourage them. May there be no discouragement. May there be no condemnation, conviction. Uh, and Father, I, I do pray in just an ongoing way. You know everybody's hearts. You know where they are and how they've done. So for those that need to start it up, I just pray for a, a, the spiritual fruit of self-control in their lives. And Father, as they do, you would just you would meet them in a way that would encourage their hearts um, in your word that would just motivate them to want to keep coming back and coming back and coming back. Uh, for those who have somehow slacked off, I, I do pray. Uh, Father, just, just help them to, to get back to their first love, to get back to uh, what it is that they've done in the past. And, and for those who have been faithful over the years, uh, please help them to just continue and continue to meet them. And Father, may we, may we honor, may we love, may we treasure, may we be in awe, may we be grateful, may we be humbled by the fact that we have in our possession, in our own language, the very words of God. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all.